Hello, I'm trying to reach David Ortiz, please. This is David Ortiz. Hello, David. This is uh, Jack O'Connell with the Baseball Writers Association of America. I'm calling you from Cooperstown, New York, to let you know that the Baseball Writers have elected you to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Yes! <laughs> Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Harbert, your host, and with me, of course, is Brandon Noe. How you doing today, Brandon? I'm doing all right, Marcus. How about you? I'm doing great. I, I know one guy who's doing even better than me, and he's up there, I guess. I don't know if he's a Dominican Republic today or, or Boston or where, but that happens to be the guy we just heard from, David Ortiz. Yeah, I think he's he's not doing half bad like ourselves. I, mean, I, I think, can imagine he could be doing worse. <laughs> I, I think this one may have been a foregone conclusion. You know, with, this was his first time on the ballot for the Hall of Fame, and he got in. And that doesn't happen very often, but it certainly did with him. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Briefly, I want to mention that Major League Baseball and the Players Association are talking to one another, and that's a good sign. There's been some back and forth, and some people are saying, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. Nothing is going to happen. They're just still just kind of struggling. And others are saying, this is a good sign. Well, I'm not buying any spring training tickets just yet. Yeah, it, something's better than nothing. I mean, it's probably kind of like the beginning of Wedding Crashers when Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn are divorce mediators. That's probably what the negotiations are like. But, <laughs> I mean, something's better than nothing. And getting closer to the uh, you know soft deadline of... The original spring training date, but some concessions are being made, but something is better than nothing. That's right. We're not going to get in that nitty gritty because we got so many other fun things to talk about. One of them is just talking about David Ortiz in the Hall of Fame. And I'll be honest with you, Brandon, you and I have been talking throughout this week and earlier. And you know, it's not something that I'm normally excited about. It's, it's not something where I say, oh, wow, this is fantastic. I can't wait to hear who they're going to announce. I've always had kind of mixed feelings about it, but when I heard David Ortiz get in on the first ballot, you know, it, it was exciting for me. And I've questioned the validity of the uh, Hall of Fame. They made some changes. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The excitement that Ortiz had when I saw that last night, it, it was contagious to me. Yeah, Ortiz is one of the more more likable guys out there for the most part in you know, I'm kind of like you. I don't really get all excited about the Hall of Fame either way. It it doesn't really matter to me like it used to a couple of years ago. And I'm pretty much like, hey, whoever goes in, goes in. But this was kind of weird. It snuck up on me. First of all, I didn't think Ortiz was retired enough to, <laughs> to go into the Hall of Fame. But now it's like, man, I saw most of this guy's career. And he's already retired in the Hall of Fame. Kind of like when Jeter went in. <laughs> yeah, and, and Jeter was especially uh, interesting because not only did he get in on the first ballot in 2020, but he was, oh, he didn't get 100%, did he? I was going to say he got 100% of the votes. What did he, he wound up, I think there was one guy who said no. <laughs> Otherwise, he would have uh, joined, I think, Mariano Rivera as being, um, having achieved 100% of the votes on his ballot. Rivera is the only guy that's gotten 100% of votes, right? Yeah, that's from what I was able to determine and this dig deeping that I did through baseball reference. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he's the one that's got that, you know, that there's a lot of them that got around 98%. Let's see. I got to dig that puppy up here real quick. Uh, let's see. If you go down the list, who else do we have? By percentage. Hmm. Okay. Mariana Rivera. We talked about it in 2019. He got 100%. Those who achieved 99 or 98, Jeter. Beneath him, he he achieved 99.7. Ken Dr Driffey Jr. is next after Jeter, which isn't surprising. Nolan Ryan beneath that. Tom Seaver, Cal Ripken, George Brett, Ty Cobb. <laughs> oh, boy. 1936 winner. And all of those people achieved at least 98% you know, of the ballot. So what does that mean? You know, who 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 gets cut? You know, you we were talking about uh, you didn't think he had been retired long enough. Do you know what the amount of time is before you can actually be eligible in retirement? Off the top of my head, I don't remember. Is, is It's five, right? 
five years. Yeah, and it doesn't feel like Big Poppy's been going that long. I got to admit it. He's, of course, he's been in front of us all the time, too, and all these postseason stuff, et cetera. <laughs> you can't exactly miss Big Poppy. But some guys, some guys who were on the ballot, but who were not selected, you know, there, there was a few names there, and we can kind of look to the, uh, to the steroid era and see what's happened there. Who wasn't there? Who did not make the cut? There are three gentlemen who were outstanding athletes. And that's, we're talking about Sosa. We're talking about Barry Bonds. And we're talking about Roger Clemens. All three of those gentlemen, I think, once you're eligible, you, are, you can be on the ballot for 10 years. And after that, you're no longer there. It goes into some other veterans category. So those three gentlemen are no longer eligible for a uh, hall of fame. And I don't know how you, how do you feel about that, man? Do you, if you think some of these guys have been on roids, some have admitted and some of them haven't, what do you think? Oh man. I mean, this is the one thing that I think's kind of taken the fun out of the hall of fame process. Cause it's the same debate every year, it seems. And I'm at the point now where it's like, Hey, if, how about this? If guys, test positive and are suspended for steroids, then they can't get into the Hall of Fame because, I mean, they were caught cheating. What if it was just like suspicion or or something like that? If it was anything but a positive test, I'd say do, do what you want. It, it doesn't really matter to me that much anymore. Yeah, there's. I mean, you think about it, there's been so many things where if you look like with uh, in gambling with, with Pete Rose, which, you know, I don't think he'll ever make it in there. He may get some other kind of place later on. But At Roger, least not while he's alive, he probably <laughs> won't get in. That's probably true, you know. And, and we'll talk about some other people who didn't get in while they were alive and whether or not they should have. But let's see. Roger Clemens, he did respond the other day. He, see, he said, thank you all on Twitter. This is uh, something from Roger. He said, thank you all for the great responses. Much appreciated. And then he has this whole thread on Twitter, which I think he had to put in about four or five different uh, tweets to fill it in there. I'll read that to you. Hey, hey, y'all. I figured I'd give you all a statement since it was that time of the year again. My family and I put the HOF in the rear view mirror 10 years ago. I didn't play baseball to get into the Hall of Fame. I played to make a generational difference in the lives of my family. Then focus on winning championships while giving back to my community and the fans as well. It was my passion. I gave it all I had the right way for my family. And for the fans who supported me, I'm grateful for that support. I would like to thank those who took the time to look at the facts and vote for me. Hopefully, everyone can now close this book and keep their eyes forward, focusing on what is really important in life. All of Okay, well, Roger. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, uh, there's one part there that I like, and that's, that's kind of the close. Hopefully, everyone can close this book and keep their eyes forward, focusing on what is really important. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a smart statement of his and one that should be relevant for all of us. Yeah, and another thing, he says that it doesn't really bother him, but if it truly doesn't bother him, he would say nothing. Is Is that true, or is it kind of like... No, or is it something else? No, I, I mean you're right. If it if it is nothing, then there's no need to comment on it, right? It's it's nothing, and and that's the way almost I was going to treat it this year. It's like eh, Hall of Fame, it's nothing. But I like Big Poppy. I like <laughs> Big Poppy, so I got to at least celebrate for that. And there are parts about the Hall of Fame that that has some interest for me. And so, well, you know, Mark, you know, who's getting in there? Who's not? And Brandon, while I'm looking at it, I'm saying, well. Derek Jeter, yeah. What didn't he get in 2021? Yeah, but he actually won that in 2020 because in 2021, no one, no one was selected for the Hall of Fame. That's kind of oh, is that kind of stupid that nobody gets elected in one year? I don't necessarily think so. I, I, I mean, here's the thing about it. All right, the election process goes like this. On this part, as far as players entering the Hall of Fame, only people who belong to the Baseball Writers of America Association can vote. Now, of those people, you have had to be a, um, what do I want to say, either a writer, yeah, for over 10 years and a member of BBWAA. So 
it isn't like I just came on two days ago and said, hey, guys, I'm, a, I'm now BBWAA. Can I go ahead and vote for whoever? No, you can't. You got you to gotta get a little seasoned, buddy. So 10 years of that. And uh, it's usually right around 300 people or so who are actually in that category So because some people die off. And uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so they have to figure out that there's a select committee that puts together like 30 names. And that select committee that puts down the 30 names for consideration of that year, then that goes out to, we'll say, the 300 and whatever number of uh, BBWAA folks. And they have until, I think, December 31st. They have it like about 30 days to fill out you know, who they want. That's sent into an accounting company. I believe it's called Ernst & Young. And from that point, all of those 370 ballots are held until basically the day that the Hall of Fame winners are announced. So I didn't know that. I thought somebody was holding this secret for a while. But evidently, they tabulated, like just Tuesday morning, just yesterday, they were tabulating who was going to be entering into the Hall of Fame. And you got to get, you got to get, it was it 75%, I believe, or more of the votes to get in. And it can get close. But did, did you say that they don't tab the votes until an hour before they announce it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's then, like, go ahead. That's like, it's like me and my homework. It's like, oh, I got all this time to do it. And then it's the last second. It's like, oh, oh I got to do that. That's what it's almost like. Yeah, it's, it's nuts, man. I mean, there's, I guess they keep some kind of sanctity to it, some kind of secret to it. And then only six people know until the announcement's made. And I guess until those people are notified. And I thought, wow. Yesterday was neat watching Bez. Big Papi Ortiz, you know, got excited like we heard there at the beginning of the show. And if you saw the video like on YouTube, the interesting thing about that was to you looked at who was around him. It was his family. But right there on the to his right, hand on his shoulder, Pedro Martinez. So anyway, I, that's one reason why I wanted to talk about it today. But what's you know, you look at this and they say we talk about who hasn't been selected over the years and that maybe if you weren't during this go through, maybe uh, later on in a veterans um, award, you know, there, there are others, but this is the main one. So 2021, sorry, guys, we didn't find anybody worthwhile that could achieve 75% people ticket it off on the box of the ballots. But it is interesting to see, you know, like I said, there are, uh, there's more than just the, the writers association. There's also, some that the veterans have put together or some special other people who can be, come in and Marvin Miller. Wow. That wouldn't surprise the heck out of me. They, the executives voted for him and you figure he was a thorn on the side as a the representative, the representative for the major league baseball players association for years. And he always said it was kind of a farce, all the voting for the hall of fame that wasn't from, the you know that was i guess they were coming from executives and not necessarily the writers association or the players but they wound up they wound up giving it to him after a few years after his death and he said he didn't want any part of it he actually made it very clear about it so much so that his family didn't offend, attend the ceremony and they said they weren't bitter about it they just wanted to follow their father's wishes other non baseball players have gotten there baseball commissioners okay <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that's not anything political, is it? You know, how did that happen? We, if we look at those, Brandon, let's see. Hmm. Oh, some of the older ones there. We're looking at Kennesaw Landis, the first commissioner. He got his into Hall of Fame in 1944. The next one he got in was 1982, Happy Chandler. And that was kind of a given. He was, he was like a political genius. I'm not saying that as a good or bad. He just was. <laughs> oh, let's see. I actually forgot. 1970, Ford Frick. Another commissioner, 2008, Bowie Coon. And I have a real problem with that one. I know more about him than I do the others just because of when I grew up. But Bowie Coon, I look back to the beginning of a free agency and the case against Kurt Flood. There's things that happened there that I just don't see him as, as being in the Hall of Fame. I don't think you should be an executive. I think there should be some kind of honorarium for people who've made a difference in the game. But I don't think it should be the Hall of Fame award. Yeah, like I believe it's the NFL, they have like other awards for like executives and 
broadcasters even it's like a, the contributor award or something like they're still going into the hall of fame i think they still get the gold jacket and everything but they're not considered like a hall of famer they don't get that title i believe i could be wrong but i think that's how it goes no that's that sounds about right and it's i don't know well and i'm not gonna say more about it but it is interesting we're talking about commissioners and i just don't know that rob manfred will see the day that he gets to be entered into the Hall of Fame. Stranger things, I suppose, but there you go. I mean, what, what so far, what would he go in for? I mean, the man who's running baseball into the ground? His legacy, <laughs> yeah. His legacy hasn't exactly been stellar. And one thing that uh, he, he isn't doing, and that's engaging the fans in a way that's in a positive way. I truly believe that he thinks he is, but it just isn't happening. And while we are discussing Mr. Manfred, one thing we can look at, too, is a recent survey by The Athletic. They invited several people, fans, to participate, asking certain questions and getting responses, what they were, you know, what they were happy about, what they weren't, what rules they would like to be changed. And we'll kind of go over some of those here in a second. But one of them, the main, one of the main questions was, how would you rate the job Man Rob Manfred has done as commissioner? Do they want my honest opinion on that? Yeah, let's start with you, man. <laughs> well, I can't say what I really think of it on air because we're a family show after all. But <laughs> I'd say just to be nice, a lot to be desired. Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think nicely. No, I, I think that's reasonable. It, we all expect more from this guy. They, what he does impacts everything. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think we can say any more about Rob Manfred. I, I think everybody has their own opinion. But another question in The Athletic was, which of the following best describes your feeling about the current overall state of MLB? Here's what, Here were the options that were given. Hopeful, disappointed, angry, indifferent, happy. Which one do you think rates, rated the highest amongst those as far as the feelings people had overall about MLB? I'd say it'd either be disappointed or angry. Well, if you said disappointed, you're right. Breaking down the percentages, 51.6% said they were disappointed. 24.8% said they were hopeful. I'm glad to hear that. 11.4% said they were angry. 9.4% said, eh, I'm indifferent. And 2.8% happy. <laughs> well, I like to meet them because I need a little happy. <laughs> so, oh, oh, my. Maybe that's Manfred's family. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, that could be the case. Nobody ever skews the stats on that, do they? <laughs> nope. Well, that never happens. happens. Never, never, never happens. All right. Well, you know, looking at that hopeful and happy one, uh, you've, you've done some work, too, on one of the things they asked the fans were, you know, where would they like to have some kind of special game locations? We've had the Field of Dreams this past year, which was amazing. And you and I talked when that happened about, where else would we like to see some things? I know one of them you mentioned were, uh, was like, uh, you talked about movies back then. I think you said, I'd like to see something based on the Sandlot. But you took this very serious about special game locations. You've done a, done a lot of homework here. And uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about those selections. Yeah, this was one that I, I really enjoyed. And I mean, you didn't know me. I have a bunch of crazy ideas I'd like to do with some sports leagues, uh, try and make it more interesting. And well, I originally called it Brandon's top five locations wish list, although it's it's six uh, <laughs> top five locations makes it sound a little bit more official. I like that. And this this is in no particular order. But number one that I thought of was the Daytona International Speedway. Hmm. And they did some renovations about a decade ago. And they really build themselves as the first motorsport stadium. And they wanted to host more events other than just auto racing. I mean, they wanted to host, you know, soccer, or football. And yeah, I thought, you know, they host such premier events. I mean, they got the Daytona 24 this weekend and three weeks from Sunday is the Daytona 500. And they call it the Great American Race. Why not have something like the Great American Baseball Classic mm. and play a baseball game in the infield? That would be huge. I've been in that infield, and it's it's large, but I, I didn't know it would actually be big enough for a baseball field. Yeah, and 
I mean, they'd have to probably do a little bit more modifications, but I mean, they've got plenty of grass and it's wide enough for a football field or, or a soccer field, which is about 220 feet wide. Now you'd have to, you know, do some renovations and maybe move the pit walls a little bit so you can have a actual regulation sized outfield. But <laughs> I think that'd be a, a really cool idea. And you know, they got the capacity for it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's centrally located. So that would be, I mean, as far as a, a tourist destination too. So there'd be more than one reason to come to the game and, I'm sure Daytona would like to do it. You know, maybe we need to float that one to their Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> we can. It's only a few hour drive away. That's right, man. So, so what else? Uh, well, you know, one other thing I can see. Maybe do you do you color this up and put? Oh, I don't know, actually have a race going on during the game. Ooh, that'd be a fun idea. I mean, it'd probably be the loudest a baseball game would ever be. <laughs> but I think that'd the, be a fun fun idea. You yeah, do a the, spring training game during the 500. <laughs> yeah, there there might be a bit of a challenge with a ball hit out of the park and onto the track, but uh, oh, maybe not. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> Thought of and thrown into the trash can all within the same 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that'd be the most unique debris caution I could think of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Get the flag down, man. All right. <laughs> give, give me. Give us some more years. All right, number two, sticking with the racetrack theme, this one actually has hosted a sporting event, Bristol Motor Speedway. And back in 2016, they hosted the battle at Bristol, which was a college football game between Tennessee and Virginia Tech. And this one, I think, would actually probably be a little bit more doable because, I mean, you see the picture right here. It holds a football field with plenty of room. And, you know, we've had football fields that have hosted baseball games. so. Thought, you know, why not put up like the teal monster like they had back in Miami when they were playing with the Dolphins? Why not have one of those and we could play a baseball game there? I love it. I I absolutely love it. I mean, I'm looking here at the photo you put up. The seating is huge. I, I don't I don't have a clue. Do you know how many people are can be seated there? Um, I believe about 160,000. Gosh, you you could cut the price of tickets and still fill that up, right? I mean, <laughs> you, you wouldn't be paying like a $1,300 for a ticket like you did at Field of Dreams. Maybe you could afford one. No, and you wouldn't have to be an Iowa, res Iowa resident only. <laughs> <laughs> I they could open it up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, all right, continue on, man. So I'm, I'm liking that. Okay? You, I'm really liking that idea, especially the volume of fans that you could get in there with that. Yes, this one will be a little bit more challenging, you know, with the seating arrangements. But Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and I sent you a picture just showing how big that the infield is. And it's so big that it can hold the Vatican, the Rose Bowl, the Kentucky Derby track, and Yankee Stadium and still have plenty of room. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if looking at the picture, I can tweet it out after the show. Yankee Stadium, it just... It still has plenty of room between the, the little short shoot between one and two, if you know Indy at all. <laughs> it Whoa. barely takes up any room. Yeah, like I said, I, I spent some time on that one, too, in a collegiate uh, holiday. and they have, I couldn't see much from where I was at, but I had no idea that it was this large. So you've got Vatican City. You've got what, what other ones in there? Kentucky Derby. And all these fit in there together. What else did you have? Looks like you also have the Rose Bowl, Yankee Stadium, the Roman Coliseum, and Wimbledon Campus. Good Lord, man. Uh, they'd have to find some way to limit the seating, but that would be huge. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm in for that one. So what do you got after Indianapolis? What do you have after the Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Well, this one's also probably the most realistic as well, but TD Ameritrade Park, which is home of the College World Series in Omaha, Nebraska. Hmm. I mean, I think that's a really nice stadium, and... It could do a really good thing to drive up, you know, eyeballs on the College World Series, which, I mean, I enjoy watching, but I think it could help drive up ratings both in person and on TV, kind of like how they do for the Little League World Series. Well, what, do you know when the College World Series is? Um, I believe it's the middle of June or so, middle end of June. Because that would be great. I mean, it would be what probably before the All-Star game, I guess. They could go ahead and have a special exposition game backing it up to the Collegiate World Series. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Good idea. It could be like a kickoff event or kind of like the grand finale. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. What else you got for us? You said top 
five or six. Give me number five. Well, this is number five. And of course, we still have one to go after this. And this was also mentioned in the uh, article along with Indy and Bristol, but an aircraft carrier. I mean, it, it would have some challenges considering a the flight deck of the carrier is 252 feet wide on the, the newest carrier, which is bigger than the older ones. And for reference, the Green Monster is 310 feet from home plate. So mm. a little bit of difficulties there, but I think, I think it'd be awesome. I mean, we had a college basketball game on a carrier, I believe, like 10 years ago. I, I enjoyed watching that. You could have Kenny Loggins do the national anthem. You call it the Playing with the Boys classic. Give this give this episode a like if you understood that reference. Oh my brother, you you got to post something on that one too. The aircraft carrier just sounds so wild. So so do we have to put them out at sea? And and how stable are those? Like, do, do you feel the the waves when you're on one of those? I've watched aircraft video aircraft carrier videos before, and it looks like they can move a good little bit, especially if it gets like really choppy and everything but i think if they were to do it in port it'd probably be a little bit more stable <laughs> but hey we could get wild and just put them out in the middle of the atlantic and see what happens Ooh. Uh, i d- i did get on the one in where it was san diego there's one in port there and it's pretty much mothballed and it was for tourists but it was amazing and i couldn't believe how much room how much space that thing took up but yeah i would love that one i, I would love that and I'd, I'd love to see somebody hit a home run that goes out into the ocean what better waterfront ballpark could you have? That'd make AT and T Stadium blush, or whatever it's called now. Whatever the giant stadium is. <laughs> oh man, that is perfect. Okay, all right. So we got five. Let's go down the list here again. You've got first one. You said you're looking at Daytona. The next one, you brought up another speedway, and that was Bristol. Then another speedway, Indy, which all it's amazing to me because I hadn't really realized how large those were. Then you brought up the Meritrade Park with the Collegiate World Series was, and then number five, your aircraft carrier. So this bonus one, number six, I have no idea what it is because you haven't told me. And I guess, is it time to open the envelope, please? Yes, it is. This one, I I saw it on Twitter. I thought it was a really nice ballpark, and a lot of people that saw it did as well. It is called Fromhold Field in San Pedro, California, and it is home to the Mary Star of the Sea High School. And that probably is the nicest high school stadium that I've ever seen. I mean, it's right there on the water. It has the cliff going down into the water, right, right beyond the outfield walls. And, you know, looking behind home plate, you have the mountains in the background. I mean, I think it'd be a perfect place for a baseball game. Well, this could be like a pebble beach of baseball, <laughs> man. I mean, I think, could just imagine the sunset. I mean, I mean, the sun would be in your eyes. That'd be a heck of a inconvenience, but. I think it would be an awesome place. You could spend the day game there. I think it would be a perfect picturesque backdrop for a baseball game. Yeah, I, I, I love this. Again, you're going to have to share this with everybody on Twitter. This this is an amazing, amazing location. Do we have any idea what the seating would be for something like that? Well, they could always modify it, so it really doesn't matter. You know? Yeah, they could probably bring in you know temporary seating like they do for Pebble Beach, like you were saying, or even for the – Field of Dreams game. I, think, I believe that was temporary seating as well. So they could always do that and bump it up a little bit. Yeah, the Field of Dreams. You know, what do you think it costs to build that? Because I, I, there was an actual Field of Dreams stadium or ballpark. But then, you know, they built one for the special game that was adjacent to it. Let's see. I'm looking here. It was, I think, 6 or $8 million. I don't know why. I figured it would be so much more than that. I thought it'd be around ten, because I mean the only real cost would be bleachers and the scoreboard, I believe, and lighting, of course. Exactly, and actually they had they built it and then they tore it down because <laughs> the year it was supposed to happen was when the beginning of COVID, and they weren't going to be able to do it. For, so for one reason or another, they decided to go ahead and tear it down, and then they rebuilt it again the next year. Did, did they, are they going to keep the field there, or are they just going to plan over it again? I th- I think they're keeping it there, but I don't know that for a fact. I mean, especially since they took it away. And I think they seated like about 8,500 people or so there. Let's see what it is. Somewhere near that anyway. Well, once again, tell us number six. I want everybody to, to be aware of, of that, because I'm looking at these photos that you've got here, and it's really drawing me in. I really want to go to it. 
Yes, it's in San Pedro, California. It is from Old Field. F-R-O-M-H-O-L-D. Pretty cool. Thank you for sharing these special game locations. Well, thank you for letting me do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let's let's take a look at a few of the other items on the athletic survey and what people said they were interested in. One of them was to eliminate extra innings. Um, no, excuse me. Yeah, I like to eliminate extra innings. <laughs> <laughs> it's a draw, okay? It's a draw. We're all going to go home or we're going to flip a coin after nine innings. No. Uh, the, 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 the question was about eliminating extra innings with a runner on second rule. And this has gotten a lot of controversy. And some people like that. They say, okay, nine innings, 10th inning. Hey, go ahead and put a guy on, on second and we're going to speed this thing up. So what happens with that? And it, it probably has, has, but does it still a little thunder of the tradition of the game? I mean, it's one of those things where, I mean, I like it. It's much better than watching a 14, 15 inning game in the middle of June when the games don't really, they matter, but they don't really matter as much. They're not on the edge of your seat games. I, I like it because, I mean, it's basically if you want to win, don't let them score. Or if you want to keep your hopes alive and you're the home team, you got to score. And if there's a guy on second, nobody out, you should be able to do that. No problem. Just put the ball in play. If you're the pitcher, you immediately, you, in that 10th inning, you've got to be paying a little bit more attention. While you've got to be focusing and getting that ball across the plate, you know there's a guy behind you who could be trying to pick up oh, some of your tails and send a signal to the batter as well. There's a lot of things to that, but uh, eliminating the extra innings runner on second rule, I don't think we should do that. I think maybe modify it. Maybe you, in the 10th inning, you don't deploy that, but if it goes to 11th or 12th inning, that you do put that rule in place. So don't eliminate it, but maybe make it in the 10th inning. What do you think? I mean, I like it the way it is, but if, if they were to modify it, I'd be, I'd be perfectly fine with it. You know, it'd be kind of like how the NHL does, you know, the regular overtime, or at least they did a regular overtime for five minutes. Now they do the, the three on three, five minutes, and then they'd go to like a shootout. So it's kind of like they give them a chance, you know, the more traditional way. And then they, step in and do it a different way. Yeah, so let's see what we can come up with that. What are some of the other things on that survey? Oh, here's one that I, I would really want to talk a little bit about with you, and that's postseason play. Now, you and I have a, a difference of opinion on this. I mean, you, you're more of a traditionalist, right? Yeah, I, I like it the way it is now. I think it's fine. And the only expansion they really should do is make the wild card a best of three. Uh, I get that because it's, it seems really sad if you, I don't know, one game really can't measure what the impact of that uh, team could be. And I thought about broadening it a little bit more, you know, maybe bringing in a couple more teams and do it lottery style too. So it isn't necessarily the next best team. Uh, it can be anybody. It could be maybe the worst one in, in your league <laughs> could actually be in as part of the, the, those additional teams. It, it's crazy. Right now, like you, I'm kind of comfortable with the way things are. I think a lot of people had, you know, wondered about the wild card when they first came in. But if you're going to do a wild card, I agree with you. I think it's good to, to give at least a three game series to decide who wins the wild card. Correct me if I'm wrong, but don't you, you said you wanted the more teams in the playoffs, right? Yeah. Yeah. I do. I'd like to see that. At, at least initially, that's what I, I'm looking at. You're, you're kind of bringing me in. Elsewhere, but I, overall, yeah, I, I, I want I want to see it last longer. If you can believe that, by that I mean postseason. I mean, I'm kind of like the season's so long. It's what maybe like Memorial Day, Fourth of July. We kind of know who's who's who. It it seems like it make the regular season even more relevant than it it kind of is now. But I mean, the more the merrier is good. But sometimes there's such thing as overkill. Kind yeah. of like 162 regular season games. <laughs> now, see, I, I don't think we had that on here, but I think that would be a way to make it more palatable to fans. I mean, it's, it's just an investment, brother. You know, you're sitting there and watching. If you if you're dedicated and you're watching, what is it? Uh, do the math here real quick. You got a calculator. If you're watching three R games, 162 games, what are we looking at as far as the investment of time? Let me see. 486 hours. 
Ooh, okay, man. That's a nice slice of life. You know, you better enjoy the game. And if you're that committed, you probably would be. And then you figure if you're actually going to the game, the amount of time it takes to get there, the pregame stuff, and the time to leave. I mean, we're just talking about people who are sitting at home with their clicker. <laughs> it's it's a little bit different. But that's a heck of a commitment. If you're looking at, at see, I mean, in football, what do you got, 18? Is it 18 games a season? Uh, this this year it was 17. 17, okay. And taking that calculator again, 17 times. What is it, approximately about 51. three? 51. 51. Yeah, roughly three hours for a game. Jeez, okay. So significantly less amount of time in a season than you would with baseball, number of hours investment. I've, I've said it. I think it would be better you know, long-term for baseball to do – like cut the season in half almost do it like that. I think that would be better because, you know, the season would feel a little bit more important because look how excited the COVID season was. That was actually exciting because every game mattered. Agreed. Agreed. That 60, 60 game season was intense and, you know, cutting the season in half, actually one of the more innovative uh, owners in baseball tried to do that just uh, this past year, but evidently got nullified by MLB. He wanted to cut the teams. Let's see. Was it? Oh yeah. Tampa Bay. He wanted to reduce the number of home games here to 41. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Enough picking on Steve. We'll save that for it's, another it's show. It's too easy. Yeah, I know, brother. I know it really is. Oh, gosh. You know, the one thing that a lot of people talk about as far as enjoying the game is, is reducing that amount of time. And there's been some question about instituting a pitch clock in the game, you know, how much time should it take between each pitch? Well, there's there's been a clock out there where they're just measuring it. They're, they haven't really been utilizing it or any kind of penalty. But at some of the games, you may, may have seen that little 20-second sign come up in the countdown. I think they've been trying to get players and pitchers, you know, a sense of um, urgency in the game, even if there's no penalty to date. A, a lot of research has been done, and – MLB, to their credit, they experiment with these things a little bit more thoroughly in the minor leagues. And I like that for a couple of reasons. One, if you are going to do it, the people who are coming up should learn about it first instead of just being thrown into the major league with it. But it, it's it's made some inroads. Let's take a look, shall we? Okay, I mean, if you're talking about pitching, what are some of the things that cost time? One of them, simply you'll see the lefty-righty tool. And by that, I mean... If you have a left-handed hitter coming up, maybe you want to have a left-handed pitcher going to it. So you pull one guy from the mound. You know, you may have three or four guys in it, depending on how many batters you have. MLB kind of curtailed that and said, well, you've got to face at least three batters. you got to face at least three batters before you can switch out a pitcher. That's one way to re reduce some of the time. You know, the another way is with the pitch clock. In a minor league, let's see, the – minor league, a league, California league to be specific to what they were called before. They put a 20 second clock in low A, but then they went it down to 15 second clock. So one of the most important things about the whole idea of the pitch clock is this is to reduce the amount of time in the game. And how are you going to do that? Well, the amount of time that it takes from one pitch to the next pitch to, to the next pitch. If you give a limitation to that pitcher saying, once that ball is back in your hand, you have 15 seconds before you get that next next pitch out. You need to be expeditious with your time. And if you're not, well, then the referee can the referee. <laughs> then the umpire can him point to you, or rather, better yet, they will point to the batter and say, take a base. So the penalty for not doing that, you know, is kind of severe. Suddenly you've got a man on base. I don't know that they'll do that with MLB, but they're definitely trying it in the lower A minor leagues. What's coming from it? seen quite a reduction in the amount of time. If you compare one of those teams in the minor league on that 15-second clock, as an average, their games are 20 minutes less than what you're going to see in a major league game. I mean, looking at the pictures that you sent me of all the stats, to me, this is like a no-brainer. It has to come in eventually, and I think it's just the penalty that they should experiment with. Should it be a ball? Or should it be a a walk? I mean, that's the only question I'd have. Because, I mean, 
the time would be shorter, be closer to two and a half hour games, which I mean, that's the perfect length for a baseball game, in my opinion. Yeah. And the offensive production went up as well. Average was up over 20 points. Slugging percentage was up almost 50 points. Home run percentage was up. Walk percentage was down. Hit by pitch was down a little bit. I think this was a no brainer. It'd make it much more entertaining and quicker. It's, it's what the, the fans been asking for for years. It seems like. Yeah. A, a quicker game and a higher scoring, more active offense period. And then actually less, uh, less hit by pitches, which everybody loves less walk rate. It would change the game. You know, if, if you're taking this and if these things uh, translate from a minor league team to the major league baseball, it would be significant. It, it almost modernized the game more like adopt with the times, which is something, you know, baseball kind of struggled with and it help a lot. You know, I, I thought though about this from a broadcasting perspective, if we continue to scale down the amount of time, does that mean there's less commercials <laughs> that, <laughs> that are placed? You know, if, if somebody, I don't know how they're paying, if they play, pay for 20 commercials, 30 commercials, and after so much time, it's just, they don't get in there. They, they don't get that many breaks. Uh, another thing I noticed from one of the, let's see, it was a Jason Stark with the athletic and he was showing the side by side, a minor league with 15 second pitch clock and a major league without any. And in between, you see batters, they would put up a screen there showing you the stats on who was coming up. Well, if you've got somebody coming zip, 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 do you lose some interest in the game? Because maybe you don't get, uh, you're not informed as much during that little lapse between pitches i mean they could kind of do it like they do now they don't always show it right away they done it between pitches before and i'd say maybe between batters they could extend the clock a little bit like it's 20 between pitches but between batters they could bump it up to 40 or something because yeah. i mean the guy's got to walk up there and everything you can't really rush him a whole lot well do we find a way to penalize batters i mean they're up here in the box. They should stay in the freaking box. How many times do they step out of the box? You know, they go spit their tobacco, tighten up their gloves, you know, what would adjust different things. And <laughs> well, we'll leave it at that. But I mean, there, there's time that's lost also from what the batter does in or out of that box. Should there be some sort of penalty for that? And what would that be? I'd say maybe call it a strike, you know, a strike for the hitter breaking a rule and then a ball for the. Pitcher break a rule. I'd say that's fair. <laughs> I would be really interested to see how that would look on the, the, the baseball card, on the back of a baseball card, whether there be any annotations, any asterisk. Not even, he had this many walks, however, 20% of them because the pitchers are too damn slow. <laughs> that, that could be a fun new stat. There I you. mean, they made up like analytical stats. Why not make up a few more? <laughs> oh, well, Brandon, let's see. Okay, you know, I mean, we've talked about things that are costing time, switching out pitchers more often, batter time. You're talking about the time from a pitcher, you know, he, how long was he ruminating, thinking about what he's going to pitch, you know. And one of the things I'll say about that too, Brandon, is if they got men on base, you know, you're going to see a pitcher spend a little more time thinking up around the mound. But what else could make a difference? Oh, yeah, replay. There have been times this past year where it seemed like three or four minutes. I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, geez, why don't get a soda, go ahead and cook up a hot dog and get the relish on it. And, oh, my gosh, the relay guys, or excuse me, the replay guys still haven't figured out anything in New York. What the heck? Yeah, that's something. I mean, that's in all sports. It seems like replay has just gone like overboard with everything, you know, time-wise and what's being reviewed. I mean, it seems like only, at least once a week, there's a call in any game where it's like, okay, come on. It's not that difficult. We all see it. You should be able to as well. Come on, let's go. Or it's like, you know what? This is taking so long. It's a bang, bang play. Let's just stick with what's there. <laughs> that happens at least once a week in every sport. Oh, yeah. It's just like, come on, guys. Sometimes it's something where it seems very clear. Or you're thinking that the umpire made a call. They're there to view it. And even if they're wrong, it's so daggone close, it should stand. I, I'm thinking, okay, what are those people up there in that replay operations center thinking? Hey, may, maybe they, we need to have a penalty, <laughs> a penalty against the uh, ups in New York on uh, on these 
prolonged relays. I mean, most of them, it takes what? Not even 90 seconds to see what the call should be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I realize some are closer than others, but there have been times where it seems blatantly obvious. And granted, I'm not that umpire on the field. And the replay center comes back with something. It's like, what? That, that, that makes absolutely no sense. You know, then you've got the broadcasters quickly going through the rule book, trying to find something. Well, maybe it's because of this. Maybe it's because of this. No, it's just because they missed it. In this case, the replay center dropped the ball. And like in the, the Phillies Braves game where the guy's foot skipped over home plate and they still said that he was safe. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, I don't know. We should have a penalty. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. Maybe we just uh, say they have to wear tighter shoes for three weeks, but, uh, or, you know, make sure they get some kind of cranial massage. So maybe the brain works a little faster. Eh. Or we can give them batting average to put up on the video board when they go to replay. <laughs> Set it up, brother. Set it up. Okay, Rob Manfred, are you listening? I know somebody from your office is. Take down what Brandon's saying there, especially on the replay center. And especially, <laughs> oh my gosh, again, is it from Old Field? Yes, from Old Field, San Pedro, California. San Pedro, California. Rob, write it down. To me, these are some of the better things you can do to help the fans enjoy the game. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I was going to come up with, but, but I, I was right. Th- I'm seeing if I had any other options that I would have picked for a special field, but you've, you've done a fantastic job. My imagination is nowhere near as vivid as yours. So <laughs> congratulations on that, Brandon. Uh, well, thank you. And if MLB wants to get in touch with me, they know where to find me at sports splits pod. And I don't charge much. I just have a bunch of good ideas and, I'll just take a little bit of a percentage of the profits that come from it. There you go. Maybe they'll give you season tickets to spring training. <laughs> I'd be like Dr. Evil. I mean, I'm hip. I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> I can do stuff. I have ideas. All right, brother. Okay. They might not all be popular, but. Well, we're having fun here, here at Baseball Biz, and we hope you've been enjoying it as well. We're hopeful that there will be a season. Heaven knows when. Maybe it'll be a short season like COVID. By the time some determinations are made and let's hope that the MLB and the players association get together, make sure that they put the fans first because without us, there ain't no game. Yeah. As much as I said last week, I'd love a shorter season. I don't think baseball would because I mean, just like the fringe fan, I don't think they can really afford to lose their interest like they did in the COVID season. But I mean, who knows? It's, it's MLB. We could have something pop up in the next week or this could go all the way to april who knows nothing nothing would surprise me with these regimes all right guys you figured it out because we're hopeful you know we're happy (laughs) or trying to be anyway so brandon take us home remember to like review rate that really helps us out and follow us on twitter i'm at sports splits pod mlb give me a follow as well and mark you're at the baseball biz on twitter yeah, and also remember, if you got my reference earlier about the Aircraft Carrier Classic, drop a like with that as well. And thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And, and send us your ideas. If you have some unique fields or some unique special events where the MLB should play some games, we'd love to hear them. And message either Brandon and myself, and we'll share them with everybody as well. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And we look forward to talking with you guys again real soon. Special thanks to X-Tech RUX for the music rocking forward.